Today, I'm going to try something a little bit different. I want to address all of the major concerns around AI, specifically how to survive in an AI saturated world, because that is what we're moving towards at this stage. AI is getting into everything from our phones to our computers to our medical offices. It's everywhere. And it's not something that we can really avoid. And in case you're wondering who I am, my name is Jason Hamilton. I am a self-published author since 2017 when I published my first book. I've worked at Kindlepreneur for a couple of years, so I got a really good handle on the self-publishing and writing atmosphere. I've written 14 books prior to the rise of AI just with my own, you know, writing creative skills. And I am also the YouTuber here, here at The Nerdy Novelist, where I talk all things AI and how to use AI practically in your creative projects. And so to address the concerns around AI, it really boils down to about three different concerns that I see most prominently coming up here on the channel from people that comment or just through looking through Facebook groups and other things and seeing what people are saying. The first major concern is that AI is stealing copyrighted data. And I say that in air quotes because there's a lot of debate about whether the use case is actually stealing or not. The second is that AI is lazy or it makes you lazy. And I get a lot of comments on this channel attacking me personally and saying that I'm not a true author because I incorporate AI in some way. And there's a growing concern that AI is going to make you less creative overall. So I want to address that. And then another big one is the concern that AI is going to replace us in our jobs or or in the case of the self-publishing world, that the market's going to get so saturated that none of us are really going to have a chance to show up at all in the market. So I'm going to address all three of these concerns in one go. So let's get into it. Number one, AI is stealing. Is it okay to use copyrighted material in an LLM or large language model training data set? Sadly, things are not looking so good in this front. There are a lot of lawsuits that have been levied against AI companies for this very concern or a variation thereof, and they're getting thrown out left and right because none of the plaintiffs are really able to prove that the output that is generated is in any way anything other than transformative from the input material. There have been many claims that these AI tools are holding like a database of all of the books and that the AI is sort of like to ruffles through that database every time that's creating an output, which is not the case. If that were the case, it 100% would be illegal. But just like a human learns, the AI is just looking at the thing and understanding the mathematics of how either language or art or music work. And nobody's been able to prove that it violates copyright in any way. Even though it does kind of feel like an injustice, definitely isn't. And I have a whole video that I've gone going into that subject, but I'm not really here to talk about that particular debate today. I'm actually gonna talk a little bit more about why that debate isn't really relevant to us anymore and why it might not last. And there are a couple of reasons for this. First is synthetic training data. We're moving into an age where these AI models will be able to reproduce the materials that it needs synthetically and without resorting to the whole problem of degradation over time. And while there will certainly be a need for human generated creative input in these training data sets, 90% of the training data that it will need can be generated synthetically. The second reason I think this is not going to be that big of an issue going forward is that the compensation for data licensing has already begun to a certain extent. We've already already seen these big AI companies making big deals with various publishing outlets, notably tools like Reddit or publications like News Corps that owns the Wall Street Journal and all of that. And while this hasn't really trickled down to creators that much, we are seeing companies being compensated, which means assuming we can keep up the fight and try to advocate for more of a compensation structure for those of us who are individual authors and artists, I think it's only a matter of time before we kind of come to a place where licensing is possible. Also, there are ethical training methods that are gaining ground. There are data sets out there that are completely ethically sourced, and it is possible to train a model on just those data sets. It's not quite as effective. And if there was a law that prevented these companies from using copyrighted material, it would slow down the progression a little bit, but not enough to really be noticeable. At the most, it would just make other countries like China get a little bit of an edge over the US, which is another point I'm getting to in a second. The fourth point is that LLMs are improving without the training 
training data. So the reason why LLMs are so great, is not because of the training data. That's a big part of it, but that is not the main thing. Otherwise we would have had AI decades before we actually did. And a good example of this is GPT-4. So GPT-4 came out in, I believe it was March of 2023. And then a number of months later, they released the GPT-4.0 model, which did not have significant amounts of training in addition to what had already been done with GPT-4. But And yet it was a significantly improved model because a lot of what goes into creating this model has nothing to do with the training data set. It's just the improvement of the technology in how the AI learns and it's able to learn more effectively as the technology improves. And so I think we'll move to an era where the training data set is going to matter very, very little and a single AI could be trained on maybe a single book and get quite a lot of input from that book. The fifth point is simply that the technology is just too widespread at this point. It's just such a darn useful tool that everybody is adopting it and kind of just like now shrugging their shoulders when it comes to some of these unresolved issues because it seems like for now at least the benefit far outweighs the cost even for artists like myself i find that most of the people that are adopting ai in the artistic space are the actual artists and authors that are creating it it's not people trying to replace the artists and authors it's the artists and authors themselves that are using it and any kind of legislation that would turn up that would negate what has already come out would not retroactively have any effect on what's come before meaning that any of the usage that has gone into AI so far would remain legal even if their law passed that said that AI couldn't train on copyrighted data anymore. If you wrote a book with the current AI available to us now, there's not going to be any retroactive laws that say that you have to take that down or anything like that. And there probably isn't going to be in any case. Technology is just too widespread. The genie is literally out of the bottle. There's not much we can do about it from that perspective. And last but not least, stopping the advancement of an LLM by restricting what it could train on and stuff like that would likely put us behind other countries where that is not the case, like China. China and US are in a kind of an arms race when it comes to AI right now. And right now the US is winning, but if anything were to get in the way, that could become a problem in the future. And this is actually probably the biggest reason why I think that any laws around the idea of limiting the training data set for these models are not going to pass because fundamentally the US knows that to do so would be to stunt progression, at least a little bit. It wouldn't stunt things in the long term, but it would kind of slow things down by, I don't know, maybe 10, 20% of the rate of growth that we've seen so far. And the US is not going to do that because the US wants to stay on top technologically. And this is one of the costs of doing so. And I know that sounds just like awful, and I'm not really probably doing much to assuage your fears right now. But the point is, this is here to stay. And so we have to think in terms of what do we now do now that this is here to stay? It is causing some issues. It's causing disruption in the industry. So what do we do? I will circle back to this as we go through the other two concerns, but I want to also leave you with this thought. This image right here, is this legal to do? First of all, we have Mickey Mouse here, and technically Mickey Mouse is in the public domain, but this version of him that you see here with the white gloves and everything and the specific design around his face, definitely not free of copyright right now. And then, he's, of course, he's wearing a Batman costume. Batman is also not in the public domain right now. And so from a certain standpoint, you could say, no, this is not legal. Like, you shouldn't do that. And clearly, this AI-generated image was trained on copyrighted images of Mickey Mouse and Batman. So why hasn't Disney and Warner Brothers respectively gone after Mid Journey, which is the one I used to generate this Mickey Mouse Batman mashup. Why has the Disney gone after this? It's because they have a big team of lawyers that basically say everything that I've just said so far. They know it's not against copyright for these models to train their data on existing copyrighted materials. However, if I were to slap this thing on a t-shirt and try to sell copies of it, or on a journal, or any kind of product that include this image, you can 100% guarantee that Disney would come after me with all of their lawyers and Warner Brothers as well. So what's the difference there? Well, the difference is in the output. This is an output that I specifically asked to generate a copyright infringing thing. And while that is possible with some tools, it's not as actually as easy as you would guess in some cases. Even though this image is completely original, it does infringe on the trademarks of these two characters. And so other than the educational purpose, which I am using right now, which is fair use, I cannot use this in any way to commercially make money. And so it is up to the author and the artist to make sure that you're using AI to responsibly in a way that the end result does not mimic any kind of existing copyright. 
I can't go out there and, you know, write Darth Vader fan fiction and then expect to be able to publish that. And that's also a warning to those of us who are authors to be sure to protect our intellectual property. If we create characters, make sure we are protecting the trademarks and the copyrights of those characters so it's clear that who owns the characters. So just a little bit of food for thought there. All right, moving on to the second concern is that AI is lazy and AI makes you lazy if you use it. Is this going to remove all creativity from art? And uh, I want to direct you to this. The best parallel for this particular concern is the rise of photography. A lot of people thought photography was also going to make you super lazy because, you know, you don't learn all of the intricacies of how to paint or illustrate a person or a subject. You can just take a picture of it. So what's the point? right? And that was the general idea, very similar to the rhetoric that's being thrown around these days. And there was a particular case that happened in 1884 around this particular photo of Oscar Wilde, and ultimately the photographer won the case. Back then you couldn't copyright images, but this image had just been copied and used by somebody else, and the courts basically said, no, the photographer owns the copyright because he made conscious choices that granted him that copyright. He made conscious artistic choices and therefore the copyright of this image belonged to him. He did things like, where is he going to sit the subject? Where is he going to place the camera? How is he going to adjust the lighting and the aperture? All these decisions that go into photography were considered creative endeavors. And by the way, who owns the copyright to your pictures? Currently under our current laws, at least in the US, it's whoever actually takes the picture, actually presses the button. That is all the creative input that is needed in order to prove that you own the copyright to that thing. Now, if you want to be formal, you can go and register that copyright. But as far as the U.S. is concerned, if you took the picture, you own the copyright, which incidentally, if you're at Paris and you're there with your significant other and somebody takes a picture of you with the Eiffel Tower in the background, guess who owns that picture? It's actually the person that took the picture, not you, even though you own the camera. Just fun fact there. So let me ask you this. Is photography an art form? I think most of you would probably say, yes, photography is an art form. There's a lot of creative input that goes into it. It is a very different art form from illustration or painting or any of those other art forms that photography replaced a lot of, by the way. That was like one of the biggest industry for artists at the time was creating portraits of people. No longer necessary because, you know, you could take Oscar Wilde here and just take a picture of him and you're done. And it was a very similarly disruptive time for artists. But let me ask you another question. Is every photograph art? Absolutely not. My daughter was playing around with my phone and was taking a bunch of just random pictures of her feet. Now, maybe somebody would consider that to be art, but I don't think most of us would. Art is a very subjective term and usually requires a lot more creative thought behind it. So while photography is definitely an art form, not every photograph is art. And I think the same is very similar in AI and how we use AI. There's going to be a lot of AI output that has had little to no human input whatsoever, and it's not going to be very artistic in that sense. And yeah, there's going to be other people who are very creative and using AI in extremely creative ways. I can think of a number of examples off the top of my head of people that used AI in a way that basically it could not have been done before with the way art worked. I know a guy who created a short story where a guy was having a conversation with a voice in his head and he basically, he would write the portions of the guy thinking and then he had created an elaborate prompt so that ChatGPT would give the response of the voice in this character's head. And they would go back and forth like that and created this short story. And like, that's the kind of thing that's really interesting and artistic. It would never have been possible without AI. It's a totally new art form, just like photography was a totally new art form. And I also get this question, like AI can't produce any original material, right? Because it's just been trained on material that already existed. So it can't, by definition, do anything creative. But the thing is, that's exactly how we are. We create out Input from input. And we technically, I don't think, can really create anything that is not a giant amalgamation of stuff that we've already inputted into our brain. We can take fresh takes on it, but it's still every little bit of our artistic expression comes from somewhere in our experience. And AI is actually very similar to this as well. One of the examples that I've been told, and I got this from Joanna Penn. If you guys have seen the Joanna, the Creative Pen podcast, I heard her talk about this at one point or where she was looking for an image of an old mermaid and believe it or not before ai came along there were basically no images of old mermaids anywhere you couldn't find them on any stock photos website or anything because it's just not something that people created and so you'd be hard pressed to find anything of an old mermaid that was not ai generated however ai 
knows what a mermaid looks like, and it knows what an old person looks like, and they were able to seamlessly merge that image together into an image of an old mermaid. This is something that is kind of original, right? And these are two examples that I created myself in mid-journey of, of an old mermaid. And what's interesting about this is that it's essentially an original concept. It's an original idea. There is nothing of an old mermaid out there. It's a mashing together of two completely separate ideas that are, have been put together in a creative and original way. That's exactly how we work. That's how humans work, where we're able to take two seemingly separate ideas that have never been joined together before from our own experience, and we put them together and we create art from that. That's kind of where most original ideas come from, is just a mashup of other things. And AI is 100% capable of doing that exact same sort of thing. So I do not buy into the argument that AI cannot create original material, because it is capable of combining things in unique and original ways. And so this is a a quote from me. Uh, and my quote is, AI without a human is inert. It cannot make decisions, take action, or iterate on ideas. Only a human can do that, which is why AI is just a tool, and only in the right set of creative hands can it be used creatively. So just like not all photography is art, not all AI use and production is art either, but in the hands of a creative person who is putting together ideas and doing things in the right ways, AI can absolutely serve that person as a tool. People think that AI can sort of act on its own and that it's actually intelligent. But that's actually a misnomer. It is not artificial intelligence. It is just artificial machine learning that has learned to do certain tasks, but it cannot do those tasks without the human guiding it. So that brings me to the third of the major concerns, and that is market saturation. So will AI replace my job or ruin my job prospects? Before I get into this, I want to walk you through the market saturation process. And we see this anytime there's a new opportunity that comes up into the world. There is a process by which this market is saturated. So some good examples are when self-publishing first came into the world in the early 2010s, that was a brand new opportunity, brand new market, lots of opportunity there that a lot of people capitalized on. Another good one is TikTok. When TikTok first started out, it was really easy to get into it. And a lot of people found success selling their books on TikTok. Nowadays, it's a little bit more saturated, a little bit harder to get into. Still a decent opportunity as of this recording, but who knows if that's going to remain the case for too long. Another good example is Facebook pages. It used to be that if you had a page on Facebook and you had a thousand people following you on that page and you made a post, all 1,000 of those people would see your post. Now you just can't. Like it's to get the visibility through a Facebook page, it's basically impossible, at least impossible enough that it's not really worth going through the process because you have to spend money and all kinds of things and there are more efficient ways to do it. So those are just some brief examples of new opportunities, new platforms that opened up and how it became market saturated. And this is the process that happens. And it happens anytime you see a new opportunity like this. You'll see it all the time after I've shown it to you. First, you have early adoption. So that means that there's a lack of competition and it leads to high exposure. A lot of people, the early adopters get in and they'd be like, this is a major opportunity. I made so much money, you know, yada, yada, yada. Grew my audience, whatever it is. Then we move on to the process of growth. So once a technology has been proven and that it works, companies start taking a loss so they can get more people onto their platform. The company itself will encourage people to get onto the platform so that they can get more and more of an audience. That's why a lot of social media platforms operated for years at a loss. Facebook didn't even turn on ads inside of Facebook for a while after it existed. They just ran on investor money for a while until they could finally turn on those ads and be profitable. Twitter was famously at a loss for years and years and years. Even Amazon was at a loss for six years. And the only reason it was able to survive those six years is just through investor money. And the investors only gave their money because they saw that the loss each year that Amazon had was a little bit less each year. So they knew it would eventually make a profit. And in in the case of self-publishing, a lot of people wanted to get the people onto the platform and reading the books. So they had all kinds of organic ways of really improving the experience for any re given reader so that they would easily find other books in that category. We called this the also bots, and it was a very easy and effective way to get more readers of the same type of books to read your book. Unfortunately, this leads to a gold rush. And so as word gets out of this platform that it's making people money, that it's building audiences, whatever the platform does, more more and more people will start to flock to this platform and it'll start to become a little bit more saturated. Competitors also will build up their own platforms to try and compete 
with this new opportunity. So think of Snapchat. Snapchat came out with the format of the story, the Snapchat story, and then that was later adopted by Instagram and Facebook and practically everybody. And now it's actually more common. Like I don't hear of too many people talking about Snapchat, but people talk about Instagram and using their stories all the time. Then we move into a revenue focus. This is the company moving into, okay, we've got a huge audience on our platform now. We need to start thinking more in terms of revenue. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to make this thing profitable. And so they start introducing ads or start getting more aggressive with their ads, meaning that people will then pay them to get ad space on their website and that drives up their revenue. And this leads to an increase in cost for those who want to find new people on this platform, for those who want to sell more books on the platform or find more people on TikTok or whatever. And it becomes a pay to play system where if you want to get exposure, you have to run ads. So it increases our costs. And nobody likes this stage, right? Everybody's been doing so well. They've been getting a lot of organic traffic. And then suddenly uh, there's a change to the algorithm and suddenly all of that organic traffic turns off or lessens significantly and you have to then use ads. And while nobody likes it, this is absolutely the norm in pretty much everything. Like just expect everything to be pay to play eventually. If there's a new opportunity, go for it, grab onto it, but don't expect that opportunity to last. You need to spend your time wisely to grow your audience and get to a point where you don't necessarily need to rely on that organic traffic. You can just, you have enough money to pay for the ads or you have a big enough audience that it doesn't matter. And then finally, we hit a level of stabilization because if Amazon charges too much for ads, then a lot of people are going to drop off who can't afford it. But if too many people drop off, then they're going to start losing revenue. And so like there will be sort of seesawing as these things balance each other out where you hit the perfect level of equilibrium between the number of people that can pay for the ads and the price of the ads with the amount of exposure that Amazon or whatever platform it is is willing to give you. Plus, you're going to get a lot of people who were thriving in the organic stage, who were just getting free exposure. A lot of them are going to drop off because they don't have the budget for the ads. They hadn't prepared well. And that in turn decreases competition, which means a few more people who are smart about it can enter into the competition. And you get a constant flux of people leaving the platform, new people coming to the platform, and just kind of, you know, it reaches that level of stabilization. And this is how we know that the Amazon KDP market was already saturated long before AI came around, because it was already deep in the pay to play stage. And these days, getting the kind of organic exposure that we used to have through like the early days of self-publishing, that is no longer possible and it's pretty much a requirement if you want to get any major exposure on Amazon to have some amount of ad spend through their ad platform. And this was already true before AI came out and AI books started to be a thing. So what about AI? Well, we already knew it was saturated because there was a mix of good, but also mostly bad books. And this was true before AI. And AI absolutely will increase the number of books on the platform. But in a saturated market, volume does not equal success. There are two things that will guarantee your success. Amazon's very good at looking at all of the millions of books on their platform and really only bringing the quality ones to the surface that people actually want to read. They look at user behavior and things like that. And there are two things that we as authors need to worry about. The first is the actual quality of the product, right? So ultimately, the quality of the book should speak for itself. Amazon's algorithm is designed to identify, due to user behavior, what books are actually liked by audiences. And all you have to do is to create content that people genuinely want to read, and you do it well. And I will point out that this is true with or without AI. You can absolutely create a quality product with AI. It just requires a little bit more human input in the process. The second thing that we need to keep in mind is the marketing strategy or budget. So this is gonna end up being the great equalizer, I think. And that is like, if you are not able to pay for ads in a saturated market, you're not gonna get too much exposure. But that would be true with or without AI, right? So, because that's the natural progression of market saturation. But the good news is, anybody that's creating crappy products with AI and just upload them to Amazon and hoping it works, those people are gonna be at a severe disadvantage compared compared to the people that are actually putting money into their work. If you're able to sustain a budget for ads, you're going to be at a level of competition that wipes out the vast majority of your competitors. You'll go from millions and millions of books to a couple thousand that are actually performing well with ads. And so that's why I call it the great equalizer. Your marketing savviness and your marketing ad spend is going to be a great way to stay alive in the millions and millions of books that were already written before AI. Everything was already 
saturated. The increase in saturation is not going to change anything compared to what we already had. And here's a quote from J.A. Conrath I just love from his blog post. And this was back in 2011, talking about the self-publishing revolution, not about AI, but it applies here today. He said, if you're really worried about readers being subjected to crap, here's what you can do. Don't write crap. And I think like I could have that engraved in a metal plate on my wall like that is in my sense, the essence of what we're getting at today. So how can we survive in an AI saturated world? Well, I want to talk about this and give you a couple of scenarios. Before I do that, can we all agree that working smarter is better than just working harder? Like you can go out and mow your lawn with a pair of scissors, but nobody's going to applaud you for doing that, right? It would be far better just use a lawnmower. And can we further agree that working smarter and harder is even better? So maybe instead of just mowing your lawn, you mow the entire neighborhood's lawn and you get paid for it, right? That's a lot more work, but you're getting a reward from it. So assuming that we can agree that working smarter and harder is better than working, not just working smarter, I want to give you a scenario with four different authors here. I call them Larry, Gwen, Hank, and Tiffany. And let's say for all four of these authors, they all have access to the same level of AI. And let's say the AI writes at about a level five. So I have level one through 10 here on the side of this graph. And let's just say for the sake of argument that AI writes at a level five, you know, not great, but also better than the average person probably. Let's look at each of these scenarios. Larry, he's not really that great of an author. He comes in at a level two. I call him Lazy Larry because he doesn't really want to do any of the work. He just sort of has this lofty ideal of like, oh, he'll write when the muse strikes and it somehow something will just take off, which is never the case when it comes to art. He also is very much against the whole idea of AI. He thinks it's cheating. He thinks that people that use it aren't real authors, etc. All of the excuses that I've heard in the past. And so he does not embrace it. And so his output remains at a level two. And uh, these are the people that are going to be losing their jobs to AI because they are not just not taking advantage of the technology, but they're not also very good at what they do in the first place. They're not putting in the work. The next group we have here is the Gwens of the world. And Gwen, like Larry, isn't really that great of a writer, but she is also very interested in working smarter, not harder. So she's always looking into new technologies. I call her get rich quick Gwen because she's always going for those get rich quick schemes and things like that, which sometimes a get rich quick scheme can be an example of working smarter, not harder, because it's just like, you know, this thing that's been costing you tons of money or time, you can do it in half the time or, you know, and so she's always going for these opportunities and AI is a heck of an opportunity. So she definitely embraces AI. And because of that, her combined level two writing skills with her level five AI leads to about a level seven output, which is significantly better than what our lazy Larry's are doing. This still does not even come close to the real hard workers of the world. And I've got hardworking Hank here who by himself before AI was producing tons of books and doing really high quality books and really doing his stuff. And he's at a, like a level eight. You know, he might not be a level 10 yet, but he will probably get there if he, you know, after another 10 years of practice being an accomplished author. This person is a full-time author. He makes his living. He works on his writing every day and he's just going to town with it. He also, however, rejects AI because he looks at it as just like, well, that's level five writing and I'm a level eight writer. And like, that's so far beneath me right now that he doesn't get into looking into all of the different ways that it could help him. There might be a small part of his writing process that he doesn't like that he could get help with the AI, whatever the case is. Or he may find that producing a first draft with AI and then actually going through and editing it and improving it himself results in the same quality of work faster or even better work if he puts in the same amount of time. And so his output remains more or less the same as what it was before just a level eight nothing's really changed because he didn't embrace that technology then we get tiffany now tiffany is also a hard worker she's right there at the level with hank same hard work ethic same deep knowledge of storytelling and experience as a writer but unlike hank she also has some qualities that our friend get rich quick gwen have and that she embraces technology she's always looking for ways to make her product even better and she's not complacent in where she's at and so she does take a look at AI and she finds out like, oh my gosh, there's so many areas that this can help me. It can help me write faster. It can help me write better. 
by le- allowing me to focus on the things that I am best at and allowing it to take care of some of the more mundane things that I'm not so good at. And she marries herself to this new technology. And by the way, this is not just with AI. This could be applied to any form of technology or methods that can help to improve an author's life. And what does her output look like at the end of things when she combines her her own hard work ethic with the creative potential of AI? It's literally off the charge. Like she ends up becoming so much better. And so that's the thing with AI is that it's a rising tide that lifts all ships, at least the ones that don't have holes in the ship, right? Like our lazy Larry's over there that are likely going to sink because of the rising tide. But if you look at where all of us are right now and you add AI, we all have the potential to rise together and end up being completely off the chart. So how do we survive in an AI saturated world? I've boiled it down to three things. First of all, don't produce crap. Okay, that's that's thing number one. Even if you're using AI, if you're using AI to produce crap, then it's not gonna sell. The second is to work smarter and harder. So if you work smarter that harder, there's nothing that anybody will be able to do to you. Ultimately, AI is a force multiplier. It'll take what you're good at now and allow you to really accelerate those things and express yourself even further and take care of some of the things that you might not be as good at. No lazy author is another quote from me. <laughs> No lazy author producing mountains of crap with AI will ever outperform someone combining hard work and creativity with AI. And I truly believe that. So what does that look like? I don't know, but there are a couple of opportunities that we might look at. Perhaps we could just produce more books. I don't know about the longevity of that particular option because like I've mentioned market saturation, right? But maybe there's other things we could do with AI. Maybe there's multimedia expansion where you could produce, of course, your prose book, but you could also produce a comic book, an audio drama, a video game, animated feature, any kind of like AI video driven thing. Perhaps AI will save you the time on writing your book so you can spend more time interacting with fans directly and building your brand on a more personal level. Maybe you could even provide personalized content for individual fans because the production of that content can be systematized in a way that you create something specifically for them. There might be other things like translations. AI translation is getting very good these days. And that's just markets that have never had the opportunity to read your books are now going to be able to have the opportunity. And this, by the way, does so in a way that the original translators don't really take too much of a loss here because you wouldn't have had the cash to produce all of those translations in the first place, not unless you were a really successful author, and the really successful authors are going to get a professional translator anyway. So other than maybe some of the translators who weren't doing a good job, most of the jobs in AI translation are going to be safe, and it's only going to be a good thing for everybody else. And then last but not least, I think the biggest advantage that AI gives is that there's basically no excuse for writer's block anymore. I truly believe that. There is, unless it's like a mental health situation, there is no situation, I believe, anymore where you have an excuse for writer's block now that you have AI at your disposal. It's just that good. So if this was a useful presentation for you, I recommend going checking out my video where I talk all about the AI stealing debate because I know there's a lot of people that get hung up on that. So I want to address that specifically. You can go check out that video and I will see you in the next one.